Okay. <clears throat> so our uh, next topic is is uh, somewhat related to that, I guess. And this time, Dr. Natalie Smith from Wollongong is going to talk to us about how can we take detect the brain at risk preoperatively. Uh, Natalie trained in anaesthesia in the UK but returned to Australia over 10 years ago. Uh, since then she's been based in sunny Wollongong on the New South Wales south coast and along with a fairly diverse clinical practice she has pursued interests in education, training and both clinical and educational research. Improving anaesthesia for the elderly and the obese, pa obese patient groups is her main ongoing clinical priority. So please welcome to the stage, Natalie. Right, here we go. So thank you, John, and yes, thank you, Neville, for asking me to speak at this meeting. And again, thank you for being here. Um, I would just like to acknowledge my sort of co-investigator and co-author, Dr. Eugene Yao, who is not here today. So this is a, a very different topic. It's a bit hard to do uh, meaningful audience interactivity. Alan actually achieved that quite well. We're going to have a little try as well. I'm going to put up this list of five words here, maybe. There we go. Um, can you please remember those words? I'll give you much shorter than you would usually be given to try and remember these words. And then also, can you please list, either in your head or on paper or on a device, as many words you can think of that start with the letter G? Again, I should give you a minute, but I probably won't because time will pass. Okay, thank you, there you go. We're a very intelligent audience, so that's all the time we're gonna get. Um, right. So the topic today, is it, the, well, the focus of the talk today is really to stimulate your thought processes, hopefully, about how we think about the brain. I'm not gonna talk about post-operative issues, post-operative delirium, cognitive dysfunction, that's covered in, and has been covered in this conference already, and that's quite a, a a uh, frequent or common uh, topic that we think about. I'm going to th talk about the preoperative assessment of the brain at risk, the vulnerable brain, why this is the case, how we could do it, when we could do it, what we do about it. And I'd really invite you to think about that. Well, I think we're all very familiar with the concept of myocardium at risk, at the concept of detecting patients with poor respiratory reserve. And it's, it's my contention that we should probably be thinking about the brain in the same way. So I'm no expert in this area. I'm a, merely an interested amateur and invited to present today based on a, a publication at ARC last year. Um, the only conflict of interest I have to declare is that I'm very passionate about this and I think we should be doing it a lot more. And uh, just to note, I'll have a main list of references up at the end on the last screen. So having said, I'm not gonna talk about post-operative cognitive dysfunction. I'm not gonna talk about this at all, but it's just there to remind us that it is common, it is a problem, and it's pretty easy for the cogs to become unstuck along the way. As anaesthetists, we're very, very good at investigating the heart to detect myocardium at risk. We're very good at investigating the lungs. We're very focused on preoperative assessment, risk assessment, minimising risk, adverse outcomes. So my plea to you today is that we should be thinking about the brain in the same way. So there are a whole heap of different terms that have been used or can be used for brain dysfunction. They all mean slightly different things, loads of definitions, and we'll just look at some on the next slide as well. In particular, we're talking about the mild cognitive impairment today. So I'm not talking about the frank, obvious dementia type stuff. We're talking about mild cognitive impairment. And in this, the importance of memory will hopefully become quite uh, clear to you. Some people consider memory to be a specific type, the amnestic mild cognitive impairment. Some consider it to be an integral part of mild cognitive impairment itself and not a separate entity. So the working definition of mild cognitive impairment today is does require memory impairment, not explained by normal processes, 
and not severe enough to actually meet criteria for frank dementia. And memory is very important. Mild cognitive impairment does not affect global brain function. It affects specific domains and the specific domain of memory in particular. Um, as Dr. Storey's discussed in this, our Professor Story earlier in this meeting as well, the concept again of ADLs, activities of daily living, is also important to this definition. And if cognitive impairment is to the level where ADLs are impacted, then it is not mild cognitive impairment any longer either. So we're not talking about a major cognitive challenge. Um, I'm sure most anaesthetists in this room could knock this off in just a few minutes. But we're talking about the mild, subtle stuff that's not readily or obvious in a casual encounter, such as even in a pre-admission clinic. And just a background there, um, in our little study, we detected a total of 121 patients who met criteria for mild cognitive impairment on a screening tool. And of those 121 patients, only two ended up having any mention whatsoever of any level of cognitive impairment in their medical record. So the vast, vast majority of those were undetected in any other sort of routine clinical sense. Okay, so here we go. Can you please turn to your neighbours and repeat those five words that we learned earlier? <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. And then um, I'll do the, I won't ask you to stand up, but we'll do the show of hands for the, the number of words you managed to get in your list. So um, less than 10. Thank you. This is a highly intelligent, highly competitive audience, so we'll see how we go. Say up to 12. Up to 15. Over 15. Oh, there you go. Thank you very much. So you have just performed some of the components of screening for mild cognitive impairment. I think we can say we've all passed brilliantly well. Uh, there we go. So I'm very glad that I put this slide into my talk only just uh, relative, very recently, <laughs> because we've seen a version of this earlier. This comes from a paper from one of our distinguished speakers, Professor Avedan. Um, this paper, well, the paper was published in a special issue of the BJA from August 2017 that looked at post-operative cognitive dysfunction. But I think this particular graph or this diagram really illustrates the importance of um, mild cognitive impairment. And we don't need to go into all the details, but you can see the top section, I won't do that either, that blue area is mild cognitive impairment. There is a threshold at which it then becomes moderate, which is the yellow area. And the patients I've demonstrated here for various purposes are all in that mild cognitive phase, therefore likely to be undetected. A sentinel event occurs and their post-operative course can be quite variable. But having a brain that is already vulnerable to further insult is going to be the focus of what happens afterwards. And um, the reference for this is at the end. I'd encourage you to look at it. It's a very, very well explained. So why do I think we should bother about mild cognitive impairment? If we can't see it, it's not obvious, so what? Um, I think it's very common. There are issues around the consensus uh, in a whole lot of areas. And there are definite consequences that I think it behoves us to consider. So very common. The prevalence depends on the age group you look at, the health background, the setting in which you look at people, and the tests that are used. Um, these are the sort of figures that you come across. Perhaps 10 to 40% of the community dwelling elderly have MCI. The first study quoted there is by Everett and Al from a, a Melbourne group that does a huge amount of research in this area. They used formal neuropsychological testing, including um, assessment of memory impairment, often from colleagues, from relatives, family and carers, and found the incidences of MCI as you have there. Our own little study found pretty high incidences, but these were people who met criteria on a screening tool rather than a formal diagnosis. I think the bottom line from all this, regardless of what the actual number is, is that it's going to be much, it's much more common probably than we think. Um, I think that we, I can guarantee you that you and I anaesthetise people with mild cognitive impairment on a regular basis without even realising it. And for me that's analogous to the fact that I'm sure we all anaesthetise people with mild coronary artery disease without recognising it as well. Um, and I think that anything we can do to raise our index of suspicion um, and to in increase our potential rates of detection, similarly to coronary artery disease, is going to be useful. 
So some of the problems about consensus in there, this area, there's lack of consensus, as we've heard several times in this meeting on a whole number of areas, about definitions, about the tests that are used, about the approaches of management, about how to measure the outcomes, about useful interventions. Um, so it's a very yeah, detailed area. This is just some of the diagnostic or screening tools that have been used. They're just some out of a huge range in the literature. Um, we've heard, again, there was a speaker earlier in this conference who discussed how she uses different tools that are not even listed here. Um, this is listed here from brief to slightly longer to really long-term stuff. Again, the reference for this is at the end. And um, the importance, I'd just like to reiterate there that if you can add subjective or objective memory complaint, it greatly alters the um, prevalence. So a few examples, just so you've got an idea of what we're talking about. This is the abbreviated mental test score. It's pretty abbreviated, 10 questions. Uh, mostly you'll see there about history and recall type questions with just one sort of executive function question at the end. This is the mini mental state. Many of us will be very familiar with this. It's probably the most commonly used tool in Australia. And again, it separates it out into a few different domains with memory, recall, and a little bit of executive function. This is the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Tool. This is the, the tool that we used in our, our little study. And you'll probably recognise some of these questions. These are some of the questions that we did earlier today. But hopefully you'll also recognise that all of these tests do involve memory and that it's really central to the whole concept. Um, these are all very readily accessible if you want to play with them yourself. I have to say, when we introduced this, the first reaction of the nurses and the study assistants was to get rather nervous because they didn't know if they were going to pass. So I think this is where it gets really interesting. What are the consequences of even just mild cognitive impairment? And I've divided them into short, medium and long term. So even in the short term, there's a whole lot of interesting issues that I think we don't often consider. Um, consent. Can you actually properly consent somebody even if they have a level of impairment that you haven't detected, if they perhaps can't remember what's being talked about, and if they perhaps have a little bit of difficulty with those higher executive functions, which include clearly reasoned decision making. How much information do you give and at what time about the perioperative period? And I'll talk a little bit about that more in the longer term consequences. The choice of anaesthetic technique, I'm, I'm sure we're aware that it's pretty controversial. Even the question between general versus regional is not answered definitively. There is a little bit of support in the literature for a couple of different measures. Um, and what is, what is out there suggests probably avoiding midazolam, minimising opioids, using dexmedetomidine, and they're avoiding or giving good acute pain relief. And then there's a balance between multimodal analgesia and polypharmacy. So there's a little bit of support for what we can do about it, but probably the more interesting questions around how we manage the patient in a more general sense. In the medium term, okay, mild cognitive impairment is known, and actually Alan I think already showed us that too, it does have an influence on post-operative function. But as we've also heard earlier in this meeting from Professor Avedan, post-operative co cognitive function is not actually a defined disease entity in itself at the moment. Is it, does it represent a specific effect of anaesthesia and surgery, or does it reflect sort of progress of an underlying condition? These are all important condition uh, uh, questions. As an additional factor, the brain is, of course, the target organ for anaesthesia, so perhaps there is an extra, um, extra sort of point there. And uh, if you would like to look at this more, I'd refer you to the editorial that accompanied our paper, which explores this in a little bit more detail. The long term. Right, so it gets really interesting here. So it is well known from the neurogeriatric literature pe that people with um, amnestic mild cognitive impairment do progress to dementia. The rate is at about 10% per year. So at five years, 50% progression to formal diagnosed dementia. And that the delayed recall is a really accurate predictor of this progression. However, if you can diagnose people with MCI at one particular time point, a year later, 40% of them will be better. So it's not in, there's not an inevitable decline. And again, I have to thank Professor Avedan. I should have just hung up at the beginning, but he mentioned earlier in his presentations that we don't usually think about post-operative cognitive improvement. And so that really raises the question, what happens? What should we do if we detect someone with MCI preoperatively? 
And if you think about it, if we detect someone with some cardiac risk factors, what do we do? We do further investigations and then we refer them to a specialist. Should we actually be referring all people whom we detect mild cognitive impairment to appropriate follow-up? And I think that's quite an important question. Would you be perhaps considered negligent if you don't and the person does go on to progress to dementia? And part of that whole question is thinking about the treatments for dementia. Okay, there may or may not be established treatments that may be more or less effective, but it is very well established in that neurogeriatric literature that to give any potential treatments out there the best chance of being effective, they need to be started early and in the early mild stages of the disease, which I think also ups the stakes for, for us. And again, perhaps it also relates back to, I think, to Professor Story's model of perioperative medicine. So that it's, if we detect something, then should we be sharing that with the general practitioner and with other healthcare professionals and looking at the whole patient in a holistic sense? I was actually going to skip this slide in the sake of time, but the best way to make a diagnosis and refer to for management is comprehensive geriatric assessment, which clearly takes time and needs resources. Interestingly enough, there you go, I'm not going to slip, skip the slide at all. Interestingly enough, when I talked to our geriatricians in our institution, and I said, look, if we find these people, what do you want us to do? And they said, send them to us, please, please send them to us. We want them, we want them all. Which left me completely dumbfounded. You actually want more work. But um, like good physicians, they would actually rather catch people early in the stage of disease to be able to prevent or delay, minimise problems later on. So you may well find that your local geriatricians are actually relatively keen to be involved in these patients. If screening is sort of interesting, diagnosis takes time and effort, wouldn't it be great if there was some simple way we could do something and get a magic answer, yes or no? Um, I won't discuss this in great detail, but the short answer is no. There is no simple, readily available, easy, accessible, routine, reliable biomarker that we can use in clinical practice or that is being used in either imaging sense, looking at CSF or even blood tests. That issue of the BJA to which I refer you has a, has a paper about potential biomarkers. Um, but it, and, you know, maybe something's coming in the future, but there isn't anything at the moment. And again, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I'm not going to go through this slide as well because it talks about post-operative stuff but um, there's a lot of resources out there. So really, what should we do if we do detect mild cognitive impairment? And the answer really is that we need time. You need time for a referral, time for thorough assessment, time for optimization and management, time to plan what should be done in the perioperative period. Um, really, the, the perioperative strategies with the most evidence in terms of reducing cognitive dysfunction is about multidisciplinary teamwork and team efforts. And we'll probably need to then think about setting up the processes and systems to deal with that. And the pre-admission clinic may well be the best time to start this because that potentially gives you the amount of time that you need in elective situations, clearly. So this is my conclusion slide. So I hope that I've um, convinced you that this wonderful, complex, beautiful organ that sits between our ears is pretty important. That um, dysfunction in this organ can happen without us even realising it. It's not necessarily going to be obvious, but even when it's not obvious, there are consequences. If we therefore want to try and find something and detect something that's not obvious, we actually have to go looking for it. It's not enough to just sit back and wait until frank dementia hits you in the face. If we think that looking for brain at risk is important, we've actually actively got to go looking for it. There are a whole heap of ways we can do this. There are tools out there, there are a whole heap of them. It doesn't really matter probably which one you choose. You need something that's going to be feasible, reliable, reproducible, practical in your setting. And then when we detect on some sort of screening system a problem, we need to investigate and refer appropriately. In the same way as if a patient came to you with a history and examination suggestive of myocardial ischemia, you would do some more tests and you would refer appropriately. So my argument is, why do we consider the brain in any different way from that? Um, as promised, this is the reference list. Uh, I draw your attention to the second and last one, which is the source of that diagram. And um, as Professor Avedan is uh, one of the main authors. And in fact, those last two papers are from that special edition of the BJA. And to completely finish in, um, anybody in the audience who can spot the inadvertent typo that's in about the middle of this list of characters,
can go home assured that they have above normal cognitive function. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, thanks very much, Natalie. Um, again, we've got a few minutes for questions. Does anybody have a question that they want to ask Natalie? Um, Natalie, I just want to ask something. Um, you talk about picking up memory deficits, and I wonder if you're over picking, up, picking them up, because there's people that will have these deficits their whole life. It's not something that's developing. And how can you tell the difference, like the cardinal feature of my three children who have dyslexia is that they've got magnificent cognitive function tests up here, but their recall is way down there. Mm. And it's been like, and it's consistent over their testing over their life. And there's a, gr a number of us that weren't born in the era where we were ever tested for this kind of thing, so nobody's ever looked. And suddenly you're going to do a, a, a pre optive cognitive test on memory on me just before I have an anaesthetic and say, you've got mild cognitive impairment. Um, where, and that may be true, but it may be a lifelong thing. You know, it's, and it's, so how are you trying to separate this out? Because since dyslexia is about a 5 to 10 percent incidence. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So I guess there are several parts to that answer. Um, partly that the information from those around the patient, from carers and relatives, is uh, very important and can give you some of that information that the patient may not give you as to whether there's been a change or a deterioration of function over time. And I guess the other main part of that is that, generally speaking, we're thinking about a screening tool. The more complex the screening to tool, the more other domains that are going to be tested. And I don't think, I'm certainly not suggesting we make a diagnosis based on a screening tool, but if it raises an index of suspicion, then that patient could go on to be properly and thoroughly and formally investigated to actually come up with a diagnosis. That would be my simple answer. Hi, Natalie, how are you? Um, I just wanted to ask if we see a patient in, who, in the preemption clinic, say they're an 80 year old and they're coming up for their knee replacement and we think that they may have mild cognitive impairment. The, the surgery is scheduled for two weeks' time. Should we, therefore, delay the surgery until they've gone through the full geriatric assessment, or should we just put in place investigation post-operatively? Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. I guess the answer, like most good answers, is that it depends. But um, so... I think the main value of raising that suspicion preoperatively is that at least you have that suspicion raised. It's something you can discuss with the patient. Uh, they may, and I think to, to really answer that, you have to consider what facilities and resources and set up and processes you have at your disposal. Um, in my place, the geriatricians actually told me that they have an open space on their dementia clinic, which is held most days of the week, that they keep for urgent, urgent referrals. And they actually suggested that they would like to see those patients, even if it was only two weeks preoperatively. Even if there's not possible to do that, you can then still arrange for other um, post-op functions. You can still arrange for some, perhaps a, a, a special awareness during the perioperative period. If this is something that's really important to the patient, they may well go, yeah, look, that's okay. Please refer me and I'll wait. I'll leave my knee replacement for another month or so. So the answer is it depends, but at least you have that heightened awareness about it. Again, the difference between anaesthetising somebody with unrecognised coronary artery disease and knowing about it beforehand. You may not do anything definitive, but at least you know about it. And surely, even despite fantastic evidence, N equals and infinity, randomised control trials, at least you know about it, and I would contend that's useful information. Hi, Natalie. Uh, Richard Riley from Royal Perth Hospital. I have one question. Um, I should tell you that my other half's an occupational therapist who works in a memory clinic, so we discuss dementia every week after week after week. So I would argue that because general practitioners are very reluctant to make a diagnosis of MCI, frank dementia, yes, because they don't want to interfere with patients' independence. I guess who are we to make a, to start the ball rolling? Why can't we just assume every patient say one year older than me, for example, has some MCI and treat them as if they're a, they have a vulnerable brain anyway. Yeah, absolutely. But then I guess I would turn it back and say, well, how are we going to treat them then? Um, 
Again, if I perhaps go back to that analogy about the cardiac side of things, and we've got all these arguments, these amazing, fantastic European and American guidelines that say there's no point in detecting troponin because there's no established definitive evidence of, of, um, you know, of the usefulness of interventions with evidence-based outcomes. But I guess it depends what you would then do about it. And yes, you could certainly make an argument that we should treat all of these people as if they have a vulnerable brain. And um, thank you for being the converted already before we even started. Yeah. I'll say that in uh, <clears throat> Natalie, thanks uh, so much. That's a, a very, very important I information to alert everybody about. Um, in the relation uh, to if detecting someone with mild cognitive impairment, it's, it's be pretty a big shock for someone to find that out. I mean, I certainly would be. And, um, and, and and people won't know. They won't, certainly won't have insight. <clears throat> Is there any role for counselling at that particular stage or you just say, well, look, you need to go to this clinic? Okay, so yes, thank you. I guess what do you say to patients who your history and investigation suggests they might have some myocardial ischemia going on that's been undiagnosed? In a way, it, that may well be a shock to them as well. So you're right, I think you have to consider the whole patient. Um, I, I think my, my initial approach would be to say, look, there's a, there's a potential, potential risk, there's an index of suspicion here that it would be in your benefit to have investigated further and to be investigated properly by an appropriate professional in this area. Um, I, it probably depends on what resources are available for counselling in the pre-admission clinic but it's uh, certainly something to consider. Yes, thank you. Alan, we have lots of questions. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, you got yourself stuck there, haven't you? <laughs> I I'm not going to ask you to give a synopsis of that BJA special edition, which I apologise because I haven't read it. But could you, could you give us any idea if there's any evidence that links MCI with physical markers of frailty? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just very glad I saw that edition of the BJ before I gave the talk, because there wasn't <laughs> much time in between. Uh, off the top of my head, I couldn't really answer that question. I'm just trying to think about the markers of frailty, which tend to be physical and other organ-based. I would be sure that, say, on that huge list of the Rockwood criteria, the multiple hit model, there would be something about cognitive impairment. Um, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what, but I'm sure that as an organ that is, can have multiple hits, I'm sure there would be at least something on that system, yes. Uh, Brendan Silbert, uh, St Vincent's Hospital, Melbourne. Um, thank you for a very informative talk. I thought it was absolutely great and you covered most of the areas. But I think there was one missing link there that you didn't mention, and that is the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease um, is present in 10% of people over the age of 65, and by the time of 80, 50%. But we now know that that disease is detectable in people in, the, in their 30s. So it's a, it's a disease that comes on early, but takes many, many years to manifest its clinical manifestations. So there is some suggestion that uh, 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 patients who have Alzheimer's disease but without any clinical manifestations are more susceptible to um, um, anaesthesia and surgery. And we, we can diagnose the Alzheimer's disease in young people uh, by taking the CSF and analysing it for levels of tau and, um, and amyloid beta. So there is a suggestion that um, uh, people with the disease without clinical manifestations will, will go on. And in fact, MCI was originally used as a, a marker of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So there, there, we believe there is a continuum from um, uh, biomarkers in the early years to, to MCI and then on to dementia. And the very, very high prevalence of disease suggests that what we're looking at may be intimately involved with the progression of Alzheimer's disease. 
Thank you. That's wonderful to have one of the actual experts um, in the room and commenting. Thank you so much. Um, so I've just realised that there are a couple of questions coming in before you run away, Nat, <laughs> on, 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 the, on, the, on the app. Um, and I think Nat's actually already sort of more or less answered this one. Um, uh, somebody's commented, informing patient and relatives that they have MCI may unleash a cascade of anxiety issues. And I think that was a question that Neville sort of hinted at. Um, and, is, and is their will still valid, etc.? Do you have a comment concerning these repercussions? Yeah, my comment at the moment is that it's really important and we should think about it. And I would contend that probably at the moment we don't really consider that as an issue. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you very much, Natalie.